I'd like to invite our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. I am Kirsten Marr. I head up analytics for, uh, for Insurity Analytics. If you know Insurity is known to be a core software uh, company. Data analytics is the fastest growing area within Insurity. And we mostly focus on helping make better, more informed decisions in underwriting. So this is my topic du jour. So uh, why don't we start with you, Brandon, and introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me today. I'm Brandon Fick. Chief Underwriting Officer at Zurich North America. I run the underwriting operations for uh, our commercial business and uh, really excited to be here today. Uh, we have a lot going on in our market and certainly we'll touch on some of the, the pricing and trends, underlying trends that are driving some of those dynamics. But really um, more excited, uh, excitingly is, is what's happening in the transformation of underwriting. You know, because of digital capabilities and automation, um, we're going through a major transformation that's here in front of us. And, you know, what I always like to say to my underwriting team is, you know, the underwriter of yesterday is not the underwriter of tomorrow. And we'll flesh that out a little bit in this conversation. So thank you for having me. Uh, good morning. My name is Scott Cinder. I'm a partner at Steptoe & Johnson in D.C., where I chair the Government Affairs and Public Policy Group. And I'm also privileged to serve as the council's chief legal officer. Going to bring kind of the regulatory perspective and a little bit of the broker perspective this morning, I hope. Good morning, everyone. Thrilled to be here. My name is Mike Carillis. I'm a director of insurance for Strong Arm Technologies. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, which many of you are not, we are a supplier of a wearable safety technology uh, that collects and measures human motion data and aggregates that data into what we call proactive safety data. Uh, my job as a director of insurance is to partner with carriers and brokers like Zurich uh, to provide them with our solution and then build our insurance product, which we will discuss how that looks uh, in the next coming conversations. Happy to be here. Yeah, looking forward to more of that. Um, so Brandon, you, you, you kind of teed it up a little bit, you know, underwriting's at the core of any insurance organization. Um, and yet the underwriting of today and tomorrow, you know, is not going to be what it's been in the past. I would even say the future is, is sort of here now. Yeah. And so when we take a look at what trends are going on in underwriting, and this is for all of you, but we'll start with Brandon. Um, why is this such a compelling conversation to have today? What are the most emerging trends that, you know, you kind of see from your perspective? Well, I think you have to start with the customer expectation, right? The customers expect a different experience than what they've experienced in the past. You know, it starts with the ease of the transaction itself. And so we have the ability today to get information that we weren't able to easily get before. And this information we would historically get from the customer, asking them lots of questions, repeated question year after year, and it becomes a little bit of frustration in the process. And we now have the ability to get that information without asking the customer. So it comes with starting the discussion with the customer. And then as you get that information and you're going through your underwriting process, the historical process was way too long. It took weeks to get quotes. And as you look at what digital capabilities are doing for us, artificial intelligence, we're now able to deliver at a much, much faster speed than before. And then you overlay the, overla uh, the risk landscape that's changing. And you know, our customers need us more than ever to understand the data. And what is the data telling us? What are the trends? And how do I apply that to my risk? And so. You add this all up and you can easily see what the future looks like, a future where we're using you know, good data that we can get on our own. We have you know, capabilities on the digital side that bring speed to the transaction. And then we're that subject matter expertise or extension of their, their risk management department that they so desperately need to build the best products. So if you think about you know, the individual underwriter then, you know, what is their job? How is it different? from what it was yesterday, today, and, and where you see kind of the role of the individual underwriter going? Well, yeah, you know, underwriters like to look in the rear view mirror, right? And say, what happened? And I want to take that experience and apply it to the future. You can't do that um, as much as, as you could in the past. Now you have to really start to, you know, be forward thinking and say, maybe that data is a little stale. There's some things that are changing in the risk landscape or Again, as technology is coming into play, how is that impacting my customer? And so, you know, the, the, the underwriter of tomorrow is very analytical. They have to really embrace data. They have to trust the data. Um, I think that's a big challenge. Sometimes underwriters like to challenge everything and get to, you know, a different outcome. You know, the data is usually pretty solid. 
and you can find different ways to apply it, but the future underwriter is one that really embraces data, but they also have the right ecosystem around them, right? A company that is investing in these capabilities, supporting these capabilities, and I think that's the transformation right now that you're starting to see. Yeah. <clears throat> I missed the prep session, so I can be disruptive. So let me ask you a question. Uh, historically, <laughs> brokers presented the data. Yeah. So in this new world where you don't need the customer to get some of the data, how do you view the evolving role of the broker? Well, look, the broker, the role doesn't go away. You know, I still think there's um, transparency in this data that needs to come into uh, the discussion. And so we may have the data, but that doesn't, doesn't take away the need to validate the data, to make sure that um, the broker understands the data points that we're using and how we're applying it to the risk. So I don't think much changes. I think it's more the operational side of changing spreadsheets back and forth and, and things like that. So it's a really good question. So underwriters historically used to get it, looking in the rearview mirror, getting their data from brokers. We're upending all of that, right? It's future looking data. It's coming from algorithms. Having worked with underwriters for over a decade with predictive analytics, right, at discretionary pricing risk selection, we have seen the need for kind of that cultural adoption and bringing people along and getting underwriters comfortable with the fact that they just have new power tools to use their expertise. Where do you see that overall adoption for underwriters, learning how to kind of use in this information and see it helping them, right, really focus on where they're really, you know, most valuable? Yeah, and I think that's the transformation that you're starting to see, which is we, we've been building predictive models for years. Um, but what we haven't done is transparently show the underwriter what are the variables, what are the drivers, and they thirst for that. You know, a good underwriter wants to see, like, tell me why I'm getting this outcome. And so it's really opening it up um, in a more transparent way to the underwriter and having discussions about why these variables are important. And that leads to a better discussion with the customer. And that's what you're starting to see now. The transparency is so key, right? Yeah. If it's a black box, it's very hard for anyone yeah. to kind of get their, their head around it. So, Mike, let's kind of bring you, uh, you know, into the conversation. You've got this really innovative IoT startup. You know, what's your take on where underwriting is going and, and how it's going to sort of evolve? Yeah, excellent. Um, just a little bit of background on, on our product, which will provide some clarity on my opinions, are we provide a wearable safety technology. That device is collecting information on how industrial athletes, industrial organizations, their workforces are moving. We then aggregate that information into safety data. Uh, today, those organizations are using that information to steer where they're strategizing around risk and delivering that insight to all the stakeholders around industrial injury risk. So the end user themselves, the industrial athlete, safety managers, C-suite members of the organization, as well as their partners in risk, brokers and carriers. Uh, Today, we are successfully re improving behavior through delivering this data. Uh, where we're beginning to trend is providing this data analytical insight to underwriters and to brokers so that they can do that transition of transitioning to leading indicator proactive data. Uh, what we need to do is build the infrastructure or the rails for the you know, everyday underwriter to use this as a supplemental tool to historical lagging information. Um, and, and we see this transition across all industries, right? Using analytics in sports to be more predictive and, for, and be able to accurate, forecast more accurately. Uh, what we're seeing today with our technology, for instance, is it's bringing everyone to the same seat of the table through that data transparency. Now the broker, the client, even the end user themselves have access to the metrics that are being used to underwrite their risk. So you look at you know, progressive and their mileage tracker information. Giving the end user insights into the data that ultimately is being used to forecast that risk allows them to improve their behavior and incentivizes that behavior and creates kind of this holy grail of asymmetric information system that both the carrier, broker, and end customer are working off of. Uh, it's very exciting to me as you know, someone who worked for Travelers Insurance for 10 years uh, and was constantly viewing the clients trying to get more insight into what was driving that rate increase or decrease ideally. Um, and, and now we're going to have real-time information that we're all sharing and working off of at the same time. Uh, and I think it's, to your point, getting the underwriters to kind of buy into that and ha enabling them to see how that solution is going to benefit them and make them a better underwriter. So, you know, why do you see work comp as such a big area of focus? 
For us, work comp is the only area of focus because we're providing an injury reduction solution. Uh, however, you know, when we look about across the challenges within the landscape, you know, imagine a scenario where you're using five years of, of claims history to underwrite an account that may have had 80% turnover, uh, an entirely new management team from M&A activity, new automotive uh, equipment on the production floor. So you're using five years of loss history to underwrite an entirely new account. Um, maybe even three and four years of that history are just not accurate anymore. So having technology that can identify hazard risk, vehicle telematics, industrial safety technology, IoT, IoT water sensor, uh, to allow underwriters to use that real-time data to be more accurate. And then embed yourselves in the organization as a operational supportive tool within uh, your clients. Great, yeah, and Go ahead, Brandon. I would add, yeah. um, you know, why workers comp? People care about their employees, yeah. right? You don't want your people getting hurt. And so there's a, a clear buy-in that we see from our customers that they want to protect their employees. They want to know the things that they don't know. What are the behaviors in our work environment that are putting our, are exposing our employees? And I think that that's why workers' comp comes up quite often with our customers. And it's one of the best data lines of businesses that you have. You have a great foundational data set with workers' comp. So I think those are two other reasons. Yeah. One of the things I see from my perspective, um, you know, you always see personal lines really, you know, leading the charge in innovation and data and analytics in a big way. In commercial lines, I've always seen workers' compensation for, I think, for some of the reasons, um, be sort of the leading line in, in commercial lines, and it makes sense, some of the why um, yeah. that you're saying. Um, so let's dig in a little bit more to what, Mike, you were talking about, the proliferation of data, wearable tech, IoT, um, you mentioned telematics, et cetera. So let's start first with the, the promise of this, of this innovation, really. And then, Scott, you'll get to weigh in with all the things we have to worry about. Um, <laughs> but Brandon, let's start with you. So if you think about, we're talking about all this data, but it, how does it become really actionable? Um, and do you see, how do you see this being able to really help insurers better price risk? Well, I think it's just getting to another level of granularity of base assumptions, right? I think we have good data that holds up across the portfolio and you can make very good assumptions, but as you start applying it to individual risk, you need those next levels of granularity. And so, you know, that's the first way it's gonna help an underwriter. The second way, you know, as you know, Mike's talking about all this technology, um, there's just some fascinating technologies out there right now that really, uh, from a customer perspective, you know, it's piqued their interest. And so when you look at the sensors and, you know, everybody's having problems with water damage, right? It's the biggest issue that we are facing in property in terms of, you know, when you find water in your building, it's usually not good. Yeah. And so little sensors that are able to detect quickly, um, you know, become invaluable. And it's not just for the cost of the insurance loss, it's the business interruption and all the other things that come with it. And so, you know, I think that's the piece that the customers are really starting to realize is that these are game changers. You know, a little device that can sense, you know, heat change, can shut off valves when there's an issue. I mean, these are real, you know, game changing, you know, technology advances that are coming through. So that sort of leads to products and coverages yeah. and, you know, um, so you can start from pricing, you know, do you see this as a more sustainable way of pricing? Uh, but then where do you see it going from you know, what are the types of products that we're bringing to market? What are the types of coverages? Like, what is it going to be changing in terms of the types of products, but also who you're offering those products to? Yeah, so I would say, you know, in the pricing, you know, is it going to be more sustainable pricing? You know, hopefully, but I think it's better pricing. You know, it's more accurate and appropriate pricing for the risk. And, you know, as we get this data, that may tell us that some of the pricing is inadequate. In other cases, it would be more than adequate and it may mean lower pricing is warranted. And so I think you're gonna get more precise pricing that comes out of this. Um, you know, when it comes to the product side, I think, again, last year we launched a great product in our construction segment, uh, construction parametric for weather events. And this, this was, uh, you know, desperately needed in that space. The, the, our customers were telling us, you know, these weather events that delay our, our projects are really a nuisance. You know, we don't know how to really build it into our costing. We might be a little conservative, but it'd be nice to have some cost certainty. All we've used is some traditional models that are out there already on rainfall measurement, hail measurement, and things like that. Not a big investment, but we're able to put these products out there to give them some cost certainty. So I think there's always a product around the corner as this technology comes through. 
And as you think about which customers are a best match for those products, how is that sort of evolving in terms of who should we be offering which types of coverages to? It feels like it's getting a lot more granular. Yeah. And there's a lot more options that you can provide. Well, and that's just it. You know, you have to make sure you understand the entire landscape so that you're not bringing a vanilla solution to the customer, that it is tailored to their specific issues. You know, the construction, again, we have a big construction portfolio. The sensors made a lot of sense for construction. You have a lot of workforce activity. It's fast. It's moving in a dynamic way. We now have the ability to create a digital view of sort of the workforce and what's happening, you know, on a work site. Um, that solution may not work for everyone. And so it is about tailoring the solutions that are out there. And, and this is why we spend a lot of time really scanning the external, you know, horizon of who's doing what. You know, the strong arms and others out there have some really good ideas and some really good advanced technology that for us, it makes sense to partner up than trying to build that from scratch. And so that's, that's, you know, I'll touch on a little bit. We do an innovation championship at Zurich every year where we invite all the insure techs to come in and pitch their ideas mm -hmm. and tell us what products may be a good fit for our portfolio. Uh, it's been a hugely successful program that, um, that we build off of and continue to do. That's and, great. And Kristen, I would just add yeah. that that's kind of where the broker's role comes into play, being that subject matter expert of this, this suite of technology that is available. Uh, and making sure that that technology fits the end client. Because uh, it's critical to both the success of deploying technology as well as driving impact or you know, loss cost reduction to the program. So. so as you talk about deploying technology, you really are pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about you know, your, your main customer base are employers. Your partners are you know, folks like Zurich in the insurance industry. Um, what was, what's been the evolution like of getting workers to wear wearable devices and what, you know, sort of like underwriters using more advanced analytics, what's it like to introduce that into the workplace? Yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, just as with vehicle telematics, getting, you know, blue collar workers, industrial athletes to wear technology uh, is challenging and without participating or utilizing or wearing the technology, the value of it disappears. Uh, so what we find is you have to incentivize the use of technology through transparent data share. Just like all of us with Apple Watches or other you know, wearable tech that you use, you're wearing it because it's beneficial to you. Uh, and ultimately, that's what our technology is. It's beneficial to the industrial athletes, giving, giving them insight into how they're lifting, how they're moving, and what risk that is causing. Uh, and so all of our testimonials are you know, evolved around industrial athletes going home and being healthier and safer because of the use of our technology. And once you get the buy-in from that end user, then you can begin to build these underwriting models. Uh, and then you bring the underwriter into the fold to explain the value to the buyer of 34% you know, loss cost reduction year over year. And it begins to sell itself. You have the underwriter on board, you have the C-suite and the risk managers on board because they're trying to reduce their loss cost. And then you also have the end user, the industrial athlete on board, because they're realizing that they're healthier because of the technology. Um, and, and, and a huge component of this, which uh, Scott, I know you're going to touch on, is uh, you know, data transparency, uh, anonymizing that data, and making sure that within the regulatory realm that you're you know, collecting and encrypting that data accurately, um, which goes a long way towards generating participation. Uh, the customers, even you all in the audience, we need to understand what is happening to our data from an advertising standpoint, from a wearable technology standpoint. Uh, and I think the entire marketplace and landscape is changing with that. Uh, you, know, you see Facebooks and Instagrams understanding that they need to inform us of what our data is doing and where it's going. Uh, it's the same for wearable technology. So before I turn it to Scott, how do you answer the question for the employee? So I love the industrial athlete. It's a great way of positioning it. But they must be asking, will this impact my job? What is my employer going to know about me? Am I going to be fired? Am I going to be penalized if they see data about me that I did something wrong or <coughs> something they didn't want me to do? Yeah, that big brother aspect of technology. Yep. Um, it, it's funny, I think insurance in general, especially commercial insurance, has always had that big brother feel. Uh, it, things are moving behind the scenes that the end user doesn't fully understand. Uh, and the technology is no different. We build into our contracts that you cannot use our, tech, our data punitively uh, for the industrial athlete, which is critical when you're trying to discuss and, and get that end user participation. Uh, we've had countless examples of enterprise clients pushing back on that language in contracts, and we're uh, pretty tough on that because it doesn't work without it. If you start to use the data punitively, the program doesn't work, and then you're not driving that ROI. Uh, so as long as I think the industry in general can be uh, transparent around how this is a proactive, positive behavioral use case of the data to try to create a better insurance product uh, and a safer environment, uh, you can generate 
positive participation. Great, thank you. So Scott, so this brings up everything about data governance. This is the fun part of the <laughs> This is the, you, you, get the fun, you get the fun side. So, uh, but it's an important side, right? And we're talking here about how to get people to even buy in to use the data, but keeping it safe, keeping it secure from a legal perspective, from a regulator perspective, you know, what are the big, the biggest themes and the biggest things that we're trying to do as an industry to make sure we're protecting ourselves and doing things right in, in the most responsible way from a data governance perspective? What, what's your take? Well, I mean, I think that's the evolving piece. But I think if you take a step back and think about the regulatory challenges, I would put it into three buckets. So start where you stopped. So misuse of data and regulating misuse of data. Uh, you have accuracy of data. And then you have the algorithms you use to analyze the data to project your underwriting rates. And all three have regulatory challenges. And if you look on the personal line space, uh, there's a lot of regulation there already. And it's where the regulators are most focused. Uh, so for accuracy, they kind of have a regime in place through the Fair Credit Reporting Act, right? If, uh, if, you're, if you don't get the optimal rate or you're denied coverage under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the insurer is required to tell the customer why uh, and point to the data elements. There's nothing like that in the commercial space, but to the extent that we can be transparent so that the broker can help validate the data, we may uh, not need any regulatory oversight, right? The industry won't push it so that we need the oversight. On the algorithm side, I think that's where you see the emerging regulatory challenges right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really focused right now on bias, uh, particularly with respect to underserved communities. Uh, so the NAIC's got a big project on this. Um, the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House has hearings, I think, next week on this issue. And it's this misuse of the data in the sense that the algorithms drive a bias, even if you don't intend it. On the health side, at some level, you already have those pieces in place. Uh, in terms of misuse, although a lot of what you're collecting isn't technically regulated right now uh, by those regimes. And so I think the danger is if you have players who aren't as uh, sensitive to this as you, uh, then you're going to drive the regulatory oversight. And they'll start there uh, because that's, I think, the, the biggest regulatory concern is this misuse of health-oriented data for purposes that weren't intended. Yeah. Um, I've always said it's, it's aligning price to risk, Brandon. So it's what people should pay, not what they will pay. Right. And that's what you're talking about in terms of algorithms and worrying about sort of bias, right? So, right. but aligning price to risk at the end of the day should make insurance more fair, right? Yes. Where lower risk right now, people will pay more because you're aggregating those rates a lot more, right? And this is getting more granular, but people who are really using it or have a higher risk are gonna start to see the cost of, of right. So how do you guys think about that? And how is Zurich thinking about data governance? Well, so when you think about the data governance, and, and I'll go back to the regulation side, it's really important for carriers like Zurich to self-regulate yourself. Um, two years ago, we put out a very strong data commitment to our customers uh, that we hold ourselves to. And it starts with one, we're gonna keep your data safe. So we treat your data like it's ours. Um, secondly, we will never sell data to a third party. And the third piece is when we give your data to a third party for good purpose, uh, we're transparent when that situation happens. And then the fourth piece is that we're actually gonna spend, you know, all of our time with your data, putting it to use for a better solution. And so I think that's how you have to think about it as an organization. It's a valuable asset for the customer and they are giving you that to, for the betterment of their program or, you know, their operations. Yeah. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about rates and we might get back to maybe some more advanced use of AI and we'll open it up for questions um, here in a little bit. But we've seen a lot of volatility in rates. Um, we have rate increases in major lines of business over the past couple of years, commercial auto, um, among others in work comp, we're seeing a lot of rate decreases. So, you know, what's your um, perspective on where rate making is going? Maybe we can start first on the increase side and think about lines like commercial auto. Yep. How long do you think that's gonna kind of last? Well. Yeah, and it is very much a line of business discussion, so we'll start with auto. I mean, you know, the auto challenge, I think, is fairly well understood at this point, right? We had a frequency of claims for a period of time that has since then level off, but what you see now is on the severity side, uh, driven by two things. One, I think all of us can appreciate the technology in these vehicles are very expensive, and when there's damage to the vehicle, uh, it costs a lot of money to get the replacement car parts. 
Uh, it's easy to get your head around that dynamic. Uh, the second piece is, you know, we, we use the term social inflation a lot, yeah. right? And really we saw that coming through in the auto liability line of business, clearly. You saw some of these verdicts coming through, nuclear verdicts, uh, on some cases that you would never uh, in a million years thought that they would go for those types of values. And so, you know, those two dynamics continue to play, play through the line of business. You know, social inflation is not going away. Uh, it is still here. It may have taken a little bit of a nap since COVID, and so it's <laughs> certainly going to wake up. Um, and then, you know, the cost of the vehicles and things like that and distracted driving. I mean, I think everyone can appreciate that people are a little bit more distracted, and that's what uh, kept the frequency levels from uh, improving. And so this, the, the whole dynamic between frequency and severity seems to be, you know, it's at the crux of kind of some of the rate, you know, dynamics that yep. we see. And so in commercial auto, when you see frequency de decreasing, severity sort of increasing. What does that tell you about where you think, how long you think this dynamic's gonna play out in terms of increasing rates, particularly for auto? Yeah, I mean, I would have thought by now that we would have been able to address the auto issues, but auto trend is 7% a year. So you need 7% rate just to keep up with what you're gonna pay in a claim, you know, versus a year ago. Uh, so I don't see auto going away. I think our view on trend on auto is gonna be at those same levels. Um, you know, going to the liability line of business, another line that started to see, you know, significant price increases, especially as you got into some of the excess lines and umbrella lines. Um, same issue around social inflation, right? It, it came through very loudly uh, in those lines of business. And it's hard to get your head around because it's every customer is impacted by this. It's not just one industry. And so predicting where this is going to come through uh, is very challenging. And so I still think there's a lot of correction to be had in that line of business. We've seen better terms and conditions, better pricing. Companies have de-risked their portfolio where they're trying to you know, go a little bit more horizontal with their risk spread versus the vertical. So the big limit deployment and the capacity that was offered is challenging in this marketplace. And I don't see that reversing. Yeah. And then on the work comp side, so people like Mike are making workplaces more safe. Yep. So you're seeing rate decreases. Kind of what's your take on you know, lines like work comp where we're seeing you know, a lot of rate decreases? Yeah, and look, the rate, the rate decreases were very warranted um, because you did see the benefits of a safer work environment. Uh, workplace safety, again, work, work comp was at the forefront of this. And so we were able to quickly see the data points that warranted rate reductions. I think there's still some room for improvement in frequency you know, as some of these technologies continue to come forward. Um, but with that being said, workers' comp is a very challenged line of business. You know, we're sitting here talking about fiscal inflation, and everybody's concerned about where are we at with inflation, and every dollar you add in workers' comp is a 30-year payout, and you got to really appreciate the volatility that you're inviting to your portfolio. This is more of a short-term event, in my view, but um, even in a short-term event, it will have an impact on some of the pricing. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on for workers' comp. And, you know, Brandon, open it up to anyone else. You know, we're, we're certainly in more of a hard market. But do we feel like hard and soft market cycles are behaving the way they did traditionally? Or do you feel like um, with everything we're talking about in terms of pricing and product offerings and, um, you know, how are all of our analytics sort of driving these different decisions? How do you expect to see kind of this hard market, you know, sort of playing out um, the same or different? to what we've seen, you know, historically in cycles? Well, I've only seen one other hard market, so <laughs> I don't know how it'll play out to that market. That was certainly different dynamics driving it. Um, I think what you're going to see is the customer's really going to think about how much of their own capital they want to put to use. Um, I think it's making people realize that there's opportunity as they bring some of these, you know, technologies uh, to improve their risk, that they should reap some of the benefits for that. And so we're seeing uh, a lot more customers take some risk uh, that they weren't willing to take in the past. And so I think that's something that may play itself through in this market cycle. Um, but yeah, I think new products are certainly going to be a, a part of this as well. You know, I think uh, this market cycle has an underlying set of issues that are being discussed at a much more detailed level with the customer that they can appreciate that the risk uh, is probably more than they thought it was. And there's some different products and maybe it's just you're, you're underinsured um, and you think it, you need a little bit more insurance on your, your liability tower or whatever it might be. So I do think 
there's opportunity on both sides. The customer put a little bit more of their capital on the table, but at the same time recognize the risk is probably greater than they anticipated. Scott, I don't know if you have anything to sort of add from a regulatory perspective in terms of what we're seeing overall in rates and you know how that's sort of just impacting the landscape. I mean, from a regulatory perspective, I think, especially in larger commercial lines, it's largely deregulated. And so I don't see the regulatory piece, but I do see the broker piece, right? Because I think that's really where we come to the forefront, how much capital you're going to use, how you structure it, things like that, a key piece of the conversation. Go ahead, Mike. I was just going to add, I think, you know, bringing it back to technology, uh, there's an opportunity to build more flexible, what we would call dynamic insurance products in the market today using the data sources that we have, which will enable us to build you know, different risk layers that fit the client's own kind of risk appetite. Uh, if you look at the work comp market today, it's you're either guaranteed cost or you're mostly taking a $250,000 deductible. That's a high margin right there, uh, delta. And I think we can use technology from a bottom-up approach, from a localized, kind of personalized usage-based model, and say maybe a, a $50,000 deductible is more accurate for this specific middle market client. Uh, and enabling us to be more flexible. I think in the past we couldn't be because we were relying on, upon 10 years of lagging claims history and old workers' comp models, whereas today we can build these dynamic products that, that offer you know, the risk appetite or layer that the client is looking for. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and look, we didn't talk about the property line of business. That's a whole other yeah, challenge right well, now. Let's do I mean, it. you know, everyone can easily appreciate the, the NAT cats, mm -hmm. the climate change impact. Um, but if you look at just simple things like uh, the short-term inflation that, that hit lumber prices and material costs, the labor shortage, um, all of this is making it more expensive to, to repair a building and get them back in business. And so, you know, that's something in the short term that I absolutely expect, um, you know, rate to continue to be driven in the property market because there's some fundamental challenges there that we haven't really seen in the past couple of years. And mostly it's been a cat focus and some underpricing on non-cat. Uh, we corrected some of the underpricing on the nine cat. The cat piece of it continues to be a challenge. Yeah, it does. Um, and so, you know, one of the things in property we didn't talk about, but is the use of location data. So we're talking about wearables, locating on the employee or telematics on the car. You know, what are you guys seeing in terms of just greater use of location-based data, geospatial data, as it relates to property? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're using it uh, heavily in the portfolio, and we're able to get better views of the property, the risk, where they sit, the construction of the properties, all the things that you know you need. Um, but again, the location, as you get back to, to CAT, uh, the flooding that we're seeing, you know, we're going to have a great case example in front of us with Ida. Mm -hmm. you know, some of these were 100-year, 500-year flood areas uh, that got hit. And, you know, your traditional FEMA flood maps and modeling do, didn't, don't necessarily hold up. And so we were bringing some different tools to the underwriters to give them the views that we think they need. And we're going we're gonna to find out very quickly if they worked or not. Yeah, it does seem, you know, so, Mike, you're on an emerging um, you know, technology field. Geospatial feels like it's finally starting to earn its spot in PNC Insurance. It was more of an emerging technology maybe even a couple years ago, but feels like it's more of a mainstay yeah. to really kind of help us through these severe weather, through these cat you know, whether it's fire, whether it's these big, you know, sort of flood um, um, events that you're talking about, what better decisions do we think underwriters and, you know, insurers are able to make by kind of leveraging this, this kind of technology? Because you're right, FEMA maps are limited and some of these public data sources only go so far. Well, and I think that's just it, right? If you discover that you're a little bit more vulnerable to flood than you thought, you may not have your equipment sitting on the first level. You may start thinking about how do I start taking some of this expensive equipment and raising it up if you have the ability to do so. Uh, your preparation for the event, certainly, you start to think a little bit harder about it. And then you may not have the appropriate coverage. You may not thought you were exposed and you weren't buying the right product. And so maybe it leads to, you know, a better product offering that you that you should be buying. So, you know, I think all of this is leading to uh, a, an exciting time for the customer and the underwriter. You know, that, that the customer should feel a little bit um, more confident that when they assess their risk, that they're getting a better view today than they were before. Um, so, Chris, I think yeah, it's an important ahead. note uh, about raising the equipment up. Because yeah. ultimately, that's what all this data is built to do, is to build better behavior. Whether it's lifting in a better posture, which is what our technology does, or driving slower, less distracted, or a better property management uh, techniques and behaviors. And so we have to view it through that context. If we're just collecting data and not changing our behavior, what is the value of it? Uh, and I think the insurance industry and underwriters have a huge portion in 
uh, you know, spreading that knowledge across the market and building insurance products to say we're going to incentivize this proper behavior through pricing techniques. Uh, everyone's aware that kind of money drives the world, and if the client's not going to see a rate decrease or some type of incentive, uh, what's going to you know, cause them to change their behavior using the data that we're collecting? It's such a great segue. So if you look at making data actionable, changing behavior, the next piece becomes just the operational uh, piece of using data and sharing that across that value chain. And so the employer has a lot of data, the agent and broker has a lot of data, the insurance, the insurer has a lot of data. How are we sharing that data amongst the different stakeholders and how difficult do we see that being? Just the sheer volume of data, technology systems are still catching up, the pace of all of this, you know, and the, and the volumes of data that we're trying to, to consume are growing so, so much. So how do we see the ability to even just from an operational perspective, share the data, where are the challenges? Yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, look, in some cases, we don't even see the data, like uh, in terms of like the technology that's being used. You know, we may not see the very specific data that the customer sees, and that's okay, because we're buying into the technology and we're buying into the bigger picture of the data. Um, in other cases, sometimes the customers want you to see very specifically how it's impacting their business and how they're thinking about it. And they want you to be a thought partner and say, is there another lens to this that I don't see? Um, and that's just behavioral conversation that has to happen. It's a transformation of underwriting, again, from process to strategic underwriting. Yeah. And when I talk about the underwriter tomorrow, we give them all the digital capabilities, all the enablers, so that they don't have to spend so much time on process. They can spend more time talking to the customer and the broker about how we use data. Again, you can get yourself into data with 95% of that data that may not even be applicable to an insured. And so you can't waste time on the data side if it's not meaningful. So you have to have a good understanding of what's important to the customer, what's relevant to the customer, and just have open conversations. I mean, that's, it's as basic, you know, it sounds basic, but it is that simple sometimes. So I think the regulatory concern is going to come up when the insurer has data that is not transparent to the customer. Yeah. So you, 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 you didn't talk about that piece, right? You kind of talked about the other coin the other way. Uh, and, but the regulators, they're going to be concerned if they don't have access to data yep. that's critical to you. And then I think the challenge is what the meaningfulness of the data. Yep. So you can share all this data, but if only these three fields are really relevant and does the customer know that or not? Yep. So that'll be kind of the industry challenge for us, I think. Yep. And I just add, it's, it's a, an unbundled market right now because of all of the technology providers. So, you know, you look at, uh, you know, some of our largest clients and they're working with, you know, a, over a dozen different technology providers within the industrial space, uh, forklift telematics, supply chain, operational efficiency technology, uh, and trying to use all of those and bundle it into some type of single source of truth or data uh, is critical. And I actually see insurance carriers and, and brokers potentially playing a critical role in that being that provider to kind of bundle those data sources into a single living product. Uh, and, and I think there's a huge opportunity to do that because right now you're right, it's remember a handful of different logins and passwords for all of your different data sources. Uh, and it reduces some of that operational efficiency that the technology is supposed to bring. Yeah. So as a technology provider, um, you know, what have been you know, some of the challenges as you're working with uh, you know, the insurance industry trying to help share the data, open up those data pipelines, you know, what are some of the big things that you see in terms of just needing to improve that technology infrastructure to support what we're trying to get done here? Yeah, so typically the data that we're providing to carriers is always going to be anonymized. Uh, so they're not going to get that information with the employee's name. So they're going to look at this information more from a job function or from a location standpoint. And uh, they don't need the employee's name. They need to use it across, you know, a location or an organization. So that's kind of step one is anonymize it so that the carrier cannot use that uh, within litigation, uh, which Scott, you would uh, have some insight in, and, and we haven't even approached that. There is probably a product roadmap out there to be a provider of a claims incident type investigatory um, uh, mechanism, but we do not want to be that. We want to be a proactive behavioral, positive behavioral based safety company. Um, and so we don't give that individual name to the carrier and they don't want it because they want the product that's going to drive better behavior. Uh, and so they just want the data so that they can be at, a, at the seat of the table discussing the analytics analytics itself uh, and to support risk control engineering. 
uh, really be strategic with where they're sending their resources. So in, in the old days, it was have your you know, field workers, uh, you know, road warriors traveling across the country, visiting all types of different insureds. Now you can identify the exact insured that needs that expertise and send them efficiently to the right place. So the data in terms of its sharing with the employer, is it only done on an organizational basis or is there individual intervention? You learn that some, a particular individual is not lifting correctly or something like that. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Piece? It's localized. Uh, so it's personalized down to the individual. They're receiving vibrations in real time when they're lifting improperly. And then they're receiving their safety score information, which is what we call it on a daily basis. So that they're enabling that one-to-one -one conversation with a site manager and the end user of how are you behaving, how can you improve. All that information is then being aggregated up to senior level folks who can drill down to the individual level. Uh, we do, especially in Europe, run anonymized programs so that the managers may not have that information. Europe is very data sensitive, as you're aware. Um, we're always behind Europe on terms of some of the privacy stuff. We're ahead, depending on how you look at it, but you'll see that coming here too, right? Because this is where the health, health information concerns come in. Yeah, we probably will see that here. I think the product works better when it's down to an individual level, because then you can coach that individual level. However, if data security is a concern, you can run it via an anonymized program, uh, and you coach to kind of the job function level. Uh, it's, it's an option, it's a solution. I would prefer to find a, a better option, which we can you know, feel comfortable with our data protection down to that individual level. Uh, and I think the insurance industry is gonna be a leader in that. Well, I actually think it's a difference between the U.S. and the EU and how they regulate. So there's very few bars on the use of the information. It's the, it's the consent and the protection that's really the focus here, I think, regulatorily. And we do generate consent from all of the end users um, if it's a, a voluntary program, which most of ours are. So you, you know, and, and um, it helps a little bit that it's in a workplace, but maybe we can take this conversation, Scott, um, another level deeper, which gets down to that, you know, sort of how are we worrying about vulnerable populations, which you brought up, you know, earlier. And so as we, you know, look at, you know, how do we protect against that? So could it mean that people get higher premiums, say, if they didn't own a, a vehicle before? Some people may have put off purchasing vehicles because of COVID and maybe doing that, so there's no data on them. Um, uh, so how, how, do, how do we all just open it up for, for the panel kind of see that playing out, um, you know, in terms of making sure that we do protect those vulnerable sort of populations and don't see data going in places where we don't intend in terms of making, you know, some of those decisions. I, I think this is where you're gonna see the biggest immediate regulatory intervention. Uh, because you can have a correlation, you haven't owned a car before, and so theoretically that should make you more vulnerable. On the other hand, that may also correlate with underserved populations. And so I think the regulators even if you can demonstrate that there's an underwriting impact, if it's discriminatory, they're gonna come down against it. At least that's the current environment. And so you're gonna see a lot more scrutiny of algorithms in those places where you can have the discriminate, well, a perceived discrimination against the underserved communities. And even in the business space, you're seeing the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Products Board, they're looking at premium financing in the business space and is there a tilt against women and minority-owned businesses in the smaller space? Based on your algorithms, it may not be intentional, but is there an impact that they see as discriminatory against those populations? But a new driver, that's a great example, a new driver, right? Historically, you know, I'm a new driver, don't have any history. You have to wait years of years of being accident-free or whatever to get some benefits. A lot of the personal line carriers will give you an option to put some telematics in, and if you allow us to track you, um, you get some discounts, and now you can accelerate that time frame where it doesn't take three, four years. If you're a good driver, you might be getting some of those benefits quicker than it would typically take. So, you know, I see both sides of the coin. Um, and so in terms of what Scott's saying, in terms of a rail to innovation, you know, what do you, what, what's your take on sort of, you know, uh, limitations on your ability to innovate given some of the you know, concerns on the regulatory side? Well, I don't, I, th I think it's just something you have to be aware of. I don't think it's going to get in our way of innovating, quite honestly. I think it's important to talk to the regulators, be transparent with them, what you're trying to accomplish, engage them early in the discussions um, so you get the right outcome. I think for the most part, uh, when we do that, we come out fairly aligned. Um, so I don't, I don't see it as a hindrance. I just think it's a step you got to make sure that you're taking. 
And so, Mike, as a technology provider, you know how, and you know, your again, your your main customer base is an employer. But how much have you thought about insurance regulations as you think about really partnering, you know, with the insurance industry? Yeah, you know, when you're on, let's call it the cutting edge of of innovation, uh, you generally have a pretty big leadway until regulation is going to come knocking at your door. Uh, and so, it's not something that is on the forefront of our mind. I think we need to deliver a product before we're you know, generally concerned about regulation coming knocking. Um, I, I would say to continue off the conversation of you know, usage-based insurance or you know, merit-based insurance, uh, it will, in my opinion, reduce that uh, inefficiency of bias. Um, because to your point, we have more data in a quicker fashion. So speed to decision-making around underwriting is saying, you've never driven a car before. But now we have so many data points from you driving for just one month, we can identify the type of driver that you are. So no longer do we need to you know, be biased with charging you an extra rate. You've demonstrated in a short amount of time that you drive with proper behaviors, and we're going to adjust that rate accordingly quickly to the dynamic insurance product. Um, so I, I'm really excited about that. I think there is a world in which that couldn't get away. Uh, we need to be careful, and that's where regulators will step in, to, to Scott's point. But the regulatory focus is always, I think, going to primarily be focused on the individual. Mm -hmm. So you're in a commercial space. I think it, it insulates you a little bit, at least in the near term. Yeah. And we, we sell mostly to large enterprise organizations, self-insured, or at least loss-sensitive programs. Those organizations are on top of regulatory concerns, and they're kind of leading the, the market in, in how to use technology. So ultimately, we re will rely upon our clients to kind of set the stage. No, oh, great. So we're going to open it up just in a couple minutes for questions. So get your get your questions ready, and um, I'll just we'll maybe start with Mike and, and work our way back. So just sort of final thoughts on you know this conversation, all of these different topics, both the complexity of risk and how we see that increasing, and we've been talking about a lot of really cool innovative technologies. But anything that you see coming next? Yeah, there's a lot coming down the pipe. Uh, I think just kind of closing remark is you think about what this could be and what it's building towards. And it's a product that improves the performance of the policy by reducing injuries. That's step one. It's giving data to underwriters to improve the way they select risk and underwrite risk, step two, which we've discussed. Uh, and then step three, which hasn't really discussed, is the stickiness that it will create with those clients. It's going to embed you as an insurance carrier within their kind of organizational uh, structure. Uh, and really create that kind of synergistic relationship where technology provider, data analytics provider are all at the same seat at the table. Uh, and in my opinion, it's it to you know, providing that customer service, which clients are clearly needing that. Technology is a way into that door. Um, and, then, and what's coming down the pipe with technology, I think you see a lot of uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, and I think that brings new challenges to the table because it is big brother, naturally. Uh, and people do not want something or someone or some technology watching them and making decisions. Uh, and so I think we need to use what we've learned you know, to date and discuss this panel and apply it to things like, like machine vision as well. I think there's tension between transparency and stickiness. And so, because I think the less transparent you are, the, easy, the harder it is for the client to kind of explore other options. And so as you sort of think about the challenges going forward, I think that's where it is. And so from my perspective, thinking about it from the broker perspective and the regulatory perspective, I want the transparency. And if we don't naturally get it, not every company may be as uh, altruistic as Zurich, um, then I think that's where you're going to see kind of more heavy-handed use of tools to try to enforce that transparency. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, final thoughts, I, I would say while we've made a ton of progress, there's still a lot of runway in front of us. You know, we're just scratching the surface. And, you know, we're talking a lot of the science here, but the art of underwriting doesn't go away. You know, we're talking about the behavioral mm -hmm. side, how you apply this. And so this is going to be an interesting time. And again, the transformation from yesterday's underwriter to tomorrow's underwriter is all about that. We still need the art of underwriting to come through. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's exciting for a company as big as ours doing as much as we're doing. We know that we're not scratch players yet. Nobody's a scratch player. There's still first mover status available in the marketplace to really hone in on your capabilities. And you only do that by making sure you understand everything that's going on around you and having the relationships with people who are spending all their time in very specific areas. So I think it's an exciting time. If I'm an underwriter today, I'm pretty excited about what's coming. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think 
listen, we're inventing, um, you know, the next chapter of insurance. And I think we're mostly past trying to say, is there going to be agents and brokers? Of course, that, you know, all of the stakeholders are going to remain and have an important role to play, whether it's the individual underwriter, the agent and broker, the insurer, the technology provider, the regulators. I think every stakeholder has to figure out what is my role going forward as we're inventing the future of insurance going forward. Um, how do data analytics help us apply new solutions to the fundamentals of running an insurance organization? It's not insurance chasing data analytics. Right. It's how do data analytics help us provide better products, more fair pricing, better rates, and better you know technologies to have industrial athletes and a, a term we wouldn't have even talked about, right, three or four years ago. So, you know, there's just so much potential and opportunity. I want to thank um, everyone for all of your great thoughts and comments.